Well, I got to the totally awesome fishing show. I looked at my files, lo and behold, I've got something just right for coming in the UK winter. A bit of pike fishing. I did it last year, I've kept it in the files, especially for you guys. Let's get down on the riverbank. Well, I am down on the river. I've been on this river for a couple of years, I guess. It's pushing, it's really weird. It's the back end of the season. It's pushing through. The colours dropped out of it. The guy in the tackle shop said the colours dropped out of it. But I don't think I've seen it pushing through. Like, well, I've seen it pushing through flooded, obviously. But it's not a bad colour when you look down there. It's got that what I call that sort of greeny look about it. Now I'm going to try and get perch or pike, whatever's about really. I'm not doing chub. Everybody else, so this guy's all along dotted about. They're all after the uh, winter chub down here. Might even come back and have a go myself. I've seen a couple of fish roll. But I'm going to give it a go. I've rigged up two rods. The old white one, which is a bit stiffer for lure fishing and a uh, stronger line. So if I get a lure caught, hopefully pull it out of the weed. Hopefully it shouldn't be too much weed. And my twitching rod here. And I've just got about a two-year-old bag of whatever i got left in there, sprats or whatever. If not, I've got three or four lures in the knapsack. I've got this thing that Mike bought me. I won't advertise it, but it's heavy. Whether I'm going to fall in love with it, I don't know. I haven't at the moment, but it's got... To, it had a liner that went in it, but the liner weighed half as much as the bag. But it has got a seat, but in fairness, I don't sit around much. I'm not one of those sitting one spot anglers. I have to keep on the move, working, fishing, fishing, fishing. Right, bait on. Got to get it in the water, boys. Back end of the season, all you river fishermen know what it's like. If it looks halfway good, you've got to go for it because it's shut for three months. I'm going for any pike, so I've got here, I'll put it against the sky. One of those VB hooks, SSG, obviously I'm on wire. I just go through the throat latch like this, pop it out, get it straight. I might need, I did actually lash out and bought two tubs of swan shot, so it might need two, but I'm starting at the top end of where I've always done okay pike fishing before, but I mean this is years and years ago. But whether those fish will still be in the same holding areas, I do not know. Same old story, be prepared to lose gear in the bottom, in snags, in trees. Yeah, it looks like I might, might want two shot on there. I like to be twitching it, look guys, just sort of near the bottom, but not in the weed, if that makes sense. Now, if you live down here, you know the river, no problem at all. You know all the holes and depths and everything. I only know where I fished before years ago. So with this pace going through like this, I've got no choice but to drop it in just a limited number of, of slacks. Yeah, I can see the... I like to hang that sprat down there and just twitch, twitch it and tweak it, but the current's whipping it away a little bit. So I wanted to stay down there. That's where I wanted to hold a bait. Look, we might get lucky, we might get a, a perch or a pike. I wonder if I can get in here. I know it sounds stupid, just to get an angle don't go in, Graham. It's very, very, very cold. If I was a pike, I'd be up behind that tree there. That's the truth of it. Yeah, the current's even coming underneath that and whipping me away. I'm going to hold it out as far as I can. That's what I'd want to get. If I was a pike, I would be right right down where the line's entering the water, but I just can't quite get it to sink down there. Well prepared to lose gear today, just the way it is. Come on. Yeah, it's getting swept. Thing is, if I put two shot on there, and the current does die off, it's going to take it down in the weed or the snag. Another spot I might catch is just along the inside here. If I chuck it out there, look. It's just room, it's going straight round. And I feel, I've always felt with a fast paced current like this, any pike are going to be down near the bottom. It's basically the, the current in the river is less on the riverbed, because the friction on the riverbed, than it is on the top. In other words, it's rolling across the top, but it's getting dragged by the friction of the riverbed. It's a little bit slower. So think of a fish living in there. Is he going to want to be fighting like this on the top of the surface? 
No, I think not. I think he might might want to lay down where it's nice and easy and just whip up and grab a fish that comes past. Hopefully my fish. Guys, I just had a pickup. I've just seen a flash down there. I'm just going to take a gamble. I'm going to take a gamble. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that was a pike. Been so long since I've been pike fishing. I'm going to take a gamble. Check the drag, Graham, check the drag. Oh, fish on, fish on, fish on. Oh, it's a good one. Oh, Jesus. He's going for the snag. I just saw that flash. Oh, good fish too, boys. Good fish. Oh, man. <laughs> the twitch sprat. I mean, I haven't got the fish yet, but... Okay. That's very slippery there, Graham. Oh, he's got it. He's got it, boys. He ain't happy. Uh, do you know what made that happen? That was that second swan shot, boys. He's quiet now. Actually, I might, might be able to lift this one. Oh, jeez, I'm sliding. Going into the river. Here he comes. Let's get him up on the mat. There we go. Got him. Well, it was a result about fifth or sixth cast. I thought he looked halfway decent, you know. Let's get the mat out. Look guys, pair four sets, watch. He's unhooked. Lock. I'll nick my own finger there, lovely. Good start. There we go, well pleased. A nice river fish. Wow, good start. Just get him down there slowly. Here he goes. Two shot did it, brilliant. God, that's dangerous there. Now this time I'm gonna try a dead roach out of a packet. It's about two years old. Now they are thicker across the back than a sprat is very thin. This is more dense, so it's gonna sink a little bit more, so I'm gonna to have to watch this. And hopefully, I don't, uh, don't get it snagged in the bottom. What a result. Whoa, if I could get two or three fish out of the day, I would be pretty pleased. I just saw as I twitched, you know, I put my polarizing glasses on, but it's just not quite, there's no need for it. And I just saw a flash, that's all I saw. I didn't exactly feel a bump or anything, but I saw the flash of the fish. So as soon as I saw the flash, I just opened the bale of the uh, reel. I still fancy that corner, you can tell that I keep casting back there, don't I? I keep casting there. I feel like there's more than one pike along there. Maybe wrong. Yeah, that's sinking much, much faster. I could probably throw that out in the middle a little bit more, try it. That's all I'm doing, look, just watch my rod top, just about a second and then I twitch it, second, twitch it. It depends, of course, how fast the bait's sinking, whether you're going across wee beds, snags, obviously you have to heat the rod higher. Wow, that was a pretty good, uh, I'm gonna say that was an aggressive take, although I didn't feel it, I sort of saw the flash of the fish. A fish is a fish, as they say. Right, I'll switch the camera off, guys, while I just work this area. Gotta go all along the inside here. Just had another hit, guys. He's right underneath me. There he is. Oh, I dropped the bait, dropped the bait. Fish about four pounds. Look, he's cut it right across the back. But I haven't got many baits. Wow. Two takes like that. Good news. He took right in close. He must have followed me in. Tells his own story, boys. A trickle of line. I've just been bumped. I don't think it's a current. Sometimes you snag the bait in the bottom and the belly of line will still keep pulling out like this. But I think this is a fish. 
We missed that last one. But we'll try this one. And we missed him as well. And he's had the bait off. But that was definitely, definitely a fish. So listen, people, here's a sort of a fishy spot. Can you see over there, there's a fast current. Because all these trees have fallen in it, it slows it. And it creates not as so much a back eddy, but a nice sort of smooth, even pace. So any food from the pipe point of view, if it's struggling in that fast current, he'll just lay there and wait for it either to get circulated in there or he's going to wait and come out and just hunt on the edge of that. But I think a lot of the time they're under places like there and that tree. But you can't really cast under that. Does that make sense? So what you want to do is cast out there. This is how I do it. It's not my way of doing it. I cast out there and I let the current bring it back around like that and twitch it. So I'm going to try one in there to see if I can get one uh, to come out sort of somewhere close under those bushes. So to get the angle right, I'm going to come through these bushes here. God, it's poking in the eye. Nice, that's not very nice. See, there's a big slack area there. But it's too muddy, I can't get in there. Sure, a pound to a pinch of salt. No one has been trying to catch a fish out of this area. Maybe there in the open. So I'm going to cast out there. Lob it out there look like that. See the current swinging it round. I'm twitching it in case anything grabs it there. But I can see the bait under the surface and I'm keeping it low underneath those branches there. So it's now going in, if that makes sense. And then I can't get right in there, it's just quite not, not quite enough current to get me in there. Here it comes, here it comes, you see that. I'm just going to twitch it through here so you can get an idea of it. Look, that's what you're trying to do is just let it sink down, then twitch it up a bit. That's what I'm trying to do. Another good spot is just off that point there, but it's got another cast in there, maybe a little bit further downstream. Gonna hold it up a bit to sort of skate it around. This, yes, you run the risk of any branches being under there. You lose your gear, but listen, hang on. I'm going right through the back door where I know pike do tend to hang out. Here's there's nobody at home at the moment. Now some people will stand there half a day and just put a float under there, but I get so bored quickly. I like to work an area, a few casts, maybe four casts. I've got to be honest and tell you normally about fourth, fourth cast is the one where I just say, do you know what? There's nothing under there, oh, right under there, right under there, right under there, wow. I thought I felt a bump then, could have been a branch. Hang on a minute, just going to hold it there. Sometimes it will sink down, they can't look at it, you just pop it like this, boom, they'll grab it. Done that many times, I know, I know that works because I've been up the tree watching dead baits. See, I can't get under there. Okay, this is the sort of place it's worth a try. Look, I've had, what, four or five casts? Guys, I've come right up. I think I actually pulled for a break over there and something's pulled back. Sounds a bit stupid, doesn't it? I wonder if he's got it, if it is a fish. I might have dropped it. I've just got the... Uh, Well, I think I've had another bump there. I'm virtually in the water with them. Oh, this time I've got a fish on. This time I've got a fish, boys. He's right in the trees. Oh, he's out. I think he's a very big one, but... He'll do. All the ones. Oh no, no, he's a white. He's a good fish. I wonder if it's that one I lost earlier. Oh, he's taking me out of the current. Oh, 
let's just see it, let's have a look at it. Oh yeah, you do, let's get around here. I've got to get a different angle on it. I've got to stop him getting in there. Here he comes. Here he comes and there he goes. That's better. That looks like a jumper. That one looks like a jumper. Now he's got it. I'm going to take a gamble and try and lift him out. Well, well, well. All those fish lost. And finally, one succumbs. Oh yeah, he's okay. He scoffed it. Come and meet my friend Matt. That one says a nice typical river pike. There he goes, he's unhooked. That one. That's a bit better by far. Wow, I think I lost an even bigger one under that tree. Got a little mark on his belly there. Oh, that's another four fish. Oh god, he's gone. It's cold water, you see. He's gone straight away. Well, result, but I'm running out of bait. Soon gonna have to go on to lures. And that's what he left me. Thank you. Well, see, the previous ones, I've left them 10 seconds, 15 seconds, it's normally enough for smallish bait. I've turned them over and the hook's pulled. It's just the way they're feeding, and yet that one really nailed it. Now, I'm going to try over the back there. Oh, look at that, look, 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 what's all that about? What is all that? Now I can get that back, luckily. Now this, just because the water's shallow there, there's a big gravel bar. I'm keeping the rod high and pushing it higher in the water and letting it sink slightly deeper this side of that gravel bar. Just let it go down there. There, I'll let it go deep there now. Deep and dark. One more throw out there and then I'm going to move on. I've got a clue what's upstream. Glad to get that pike. I've had another cast in here because I thought there was a second fish, but he's not taken, so we're going to work my way upstream. Oh, if I can get out. I'm going to work my way upstream and then uh, I might possibly come back. And when I've had a fish, I'll still have a throw in a lot of the swims on the way back downstream again because you never know, there might be one in there, or indeed another fish might move in that spot. Let's move out. Now, here is a great big sort of whirlpool, it probably gets hugely caned. By pike anglers, I can imagine it's a traditional. Let's put that down. Traditional sort of pike place. Very, very fast there. I'm fancying just immediately there. You look in the fishing books, probably says straight in the weir pool, you know, where it back head is. But there's a little hole up there. There's, there's a spot there. There's a spot here. You don't want it sort of too boily and swirly. We'll give it a go. I didn't check actually, but I still got my two shot on there. It looks like it's sinking too slowly. Doubtless this would be good legend for barbel. So I let it go roughly, uh, so I'm going to say three, four, five feet down, probably four feet down. It's, it's really pumping through the current, so it's holding the bait up quite a bit. I think I might have lost a shot off of this somehow. Let's just check it, and all I do just here is just, just tweaking it. I thought so, look, one shot's gone. God, that's two shot I've lost all day, that's terrible. About two pounds something for nine, not even that. Can't even fill it up, can they? Don't use your teeth, Graham, too late. That last pike must have uh, pulled a shot off with his teeth, that's better. So I can see immediately if I put it up there. I can sort of feel it as I twitch it. It pulls the rod round more. And also 
There's a difference in the sync speed between casting downstream, twitching it back against the current, as I'm doing here in the back eddy, or going upstream and coming down, it will make it feel light. I'll do quite like just a tip going upstream like that, letting it sink down. Because it's supposed to look like a wounded fish twitching about like this. Wounded fish is unlikely to do very well in a strong current like that, is it? It's going to probably get swept downstream. So anything going downstream is going to look natural for a pike to grab like it's struggling against the current. Very often you just feel a bang. You've got to be prepared to do this, look. Boom. Fast as that. Open the bail arm like that so you can take nine and you can wind down and strike the timings up to you. Right, now there's a bit of a slack round here over there which I'm fancying. It's very similar to that one where I did around the bush round there, letting it sort of swing round a bit. And in that area there, if I was a pike, I would be laying there quite comfortably, resting on the bottom, just waiting to flash up and grab something. Let's try that corner. The truth is, you don't really know where they are. You think you do as anglers, just from experience of having caught them in similar um, areas before but there's no guarantee with the next sometimes people will catch in that fast water i have caught in the fast water i remember catching a 17 pounder once and god it's pace ripping through i wasn't even sure it was a fish till i uh, set the hook this is obviously part of where joe public comes and i assume the dogs will come along this because that's foot public footpath you can see how they wear it away that's not worn away by anglers but there is a, a very nice, albeit slippery, dangerous hole here. Did I just say that? You know what I mean. A dangerous fishing hole. That's a very, very, very pike fishy, this one. Just the pace, the pace of it where it dies off. I'm just letting it sort of dance around there. And we'll be in a rush to lift it out because there could be a pipe right under there that comes out and grabs it. Go a little bit farther over. I tend to want to be on the corner. I always want to be on the corners more. And what I do is, it's a risk you take, but you let the bait go down and when the line goes slack, you know you're on the bottom and that gives you time of depth, you know, to, for the bait to sink to the bottom in that particular spot. Frankly, I'm amazed there's not, to, there's not a pike at home there. I'm going to do the same here. I'm going to cast out and let the current take it round because I can't cast through there. I don't need to go in. It will be cold in the winter. Some tree roots down there. are going to have to watch those as well. Yeah, it looks a very fishy spot. Just trying to hold it there as long as I can. Up and over the snags, and let it sink down again in case there's one laying there. Nope. Well, I've twitched this through about six times now. I feel if there was uh, anybody at home, they would, have, they would have nailed that bait by now. So it's a question of move on to the next one. And that's why, as you can see, I'm travelling light. I think I've had a bump in here. As you can see the fast currents there goes around very very slight eddy here most people would fish there I've been awkward and come and put my bait if I can get in it right in here and if there's anything here he's right underneath me I'm gonna go and backwind as well I'm sure there was a take yeah fish on there he goes I thought I was right there's the bait in his mouth. You see what I mean about that slack? Here he comes, not a big fish. And there is a nice little chappy. Couldn't ask for better, could you, eh? Absolutely gagged on that bait. Not a big fish. We know it's not a big fish. It's what, two feet long? It's a fish. 
So I'm not going to get much out of that bait now. There we go. Success in every totally awesome packet. As the saying goes, sweet. See the slack? Fast water slack. Might even be another fish in there. Right, the update is this, guys. I've run out of bait. I've now run out of bait. I've hooked eight pike up. Eight. I've got three. So the hookup rate is um, good. The netting rate is not good. So I'm right down by the busy motorway bridge now. Might be noisy probably here. It's thousands of cars. Going to go on the lures. Rod here. Big wheel, it's an SW4500, whatever it is, H-E Namura, I think it is. And a white, the old white kanji rod that I use bass fishing and stuff. Do that up. I do bass fishing and that. And on that I've got a big lead-headed jig. Single hook. I'm just casting, guys, that's all I'm doing. I don't hold out much hope, if at all, any, because I've left my main uh, lure box in a car, because I, I didn't really, you know, want to go lure fishing in this fast water I like it a bit slower we'll give it a go anyway gonna have something to eat so time to call it quits here at least I've had three pike and that's what you get at the end of the season you just have to go with it you just, look you're going fishing for the sake of going fishing really I wish I bought some more bait but having said that they weren't really voraciously feeding because you know you hook eight you want six I'm gonna say you shouldn't lose too many but I got three better than nothing I haven't, I think I saw one other fish caught, uh, done it as a chub or pike or barbel, a small four pound or five pound, something like that. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. Give me a break getting out anyway. Don't forget, watch the Totally Awesome Fishing Show and TA Outdoors. Hit that subscribe button on both and we'll see you in the next fishing program. There's a fantastic place over there, but I lost two lures in it. Obviously the branches crashed down. I shall mark those two and those two for another session on another year. Well, I didn't get any more pike after that, but it's still enjoyable to be out and with the whole of the winter coming towards us. Ooh, it's gonna be a cold one. Get out roving. I don't personally like sitting by gravel pits with one big bait. I know that's how you get the big fish, I know that. But I like to be mobile, moving, hit different swims, and keep going. Anyway, we're back here in the theory time office again. The last film I brought up, you guys seem to enjoy. So, there's a little bit more. I've got a repair to do as well, a bit of a disaster. A couple of ideas for you. And you may have noticed a bit of a change in the background. I've moved stuff around because from the filming angles I've got there, I thought people can't see the Wahoo head because it's direct onto them. Now the Wahoo is allegedly the fastest fish in the ocean, 70 miles an hour they reckon it goes. It has a fixed hinge, okay, or a, a fixed bottom jaw and a hinge at the top. So it acts like a pair of scissors. Tiny little teeth, they are lethal. They are like a mouthful of razor blades. And obviously that snipping action coupled to sharp teeth, coupled to huge acceleration and burst of power, you get a slam intake, and of course for marlin fishermen, if you're using live baits or dead baits, they will chop a five, ten pound bonito straight in half. So that's up there. Also got, which people don't realise, because he probably, I've probably never shown it before, a couple of barracuda heads there. Now these are skin mounts, these are those plastic ones like the tarpon one, you know, where they measure it and send it to the, you know, plastic manufacturers and you get one. These are skin mounts. I bought those back from the Florida Keys, one of the early trips I used to go over there, sometimes three times a year, when the dollar rate was good, not at the moment. And I thought I'd just show you the teeth on the Barracuda. The lower one actually locks into a hole in the roof of the mouth of the top. So he's pretty much like a sort of Wahoo in that really pointed nose. Fast burst of acceleration, obviously not as fast as a Wahoo. You can catch them in deep water, mostly around reefs, and you catch them in shallow water. They were caught in shallow water when I was out messing around for whatever, you know, sharks, tarp and stuff like that. I'll tell you exactly where I was. I was just on the north side of the Indian Quay, which is a small island just 
bottom end of Isle of Morado where the bridges meet and you've got Indian Key Bridge and you can go out. And it used to be a, a prime fly fishing for target spot. So there's the Barracuda and boy have they got a set of dentures, no question about that. What else have we got? Oh back there, I'm going to probably move that one because I'm going to get flare off it at the back. That was down Key West on the Marquesas, out with the wife. Um, saw, we, no, we were black, we were fishing for black tips, doing a film for a magazine for black tips. That's the shark. <clears throat> and we were out the back of one of the channels, hooked two huge fish in two separate days. Uh, we were down there. I got a saw, a saw, not a sword, saw fish. There's another one along the right there, of 450 pounds. And the wife, wait for this, got one the next day, 350 pounds. That's good fish for a lady. We've got our plate thing there, I've got my gone fishing sign, I've got an old reel there which was, used to be used big game fishing years ago, that was the go-to one, a couple of marlin bills, old lad in this, just stuff, just got to fit off. A big um, grouper there, Goliath grouper, we used to be able to put them in a boat, again down the Florida Keys. So, I did a lot down the Florida Keys, got a rack of pictures up there, I've never shown them because they're all fish hanging up which we've eaten, so people go, oh, it's dead, well it was dead because we're eating it. Obviously, yeah, people don't realise a lot of the time where food in a plastic bag in a supermarket comes from. However, I've digressed because it's big game fishing. Anyway, where are we going to go? Let's check the list out. I'm thinking about the drought. I mean, this year I was old enough to be fishing in the 1976 drought. And I've got pictures of Tubby Pond dried out. I can't dig them out now, but I've got them. I'll put them up. Absolutely dried, cracked everywhere. And it was getting pretty serious one of this last summer in the UK. But I noticed these droughts are getting more uh, sort of localised around the world, not just for us. And they seem to be balanced with huge rainfall in clumps, as it were, around the world. I'm not talking hurricanes, I'm just talking high pressure systems, I guess low pressure systems. I wonder, and I have wondered this for a long time, Here's the globe. This is theory time. This will send your head into orbit. Here is theory time. There's the planet, okay? If there is, let's say, a, an excessive amount of rain down here, I'm going to argue and say the Philippines, Asia that way, and they've had a lot of rain last year, a lot of flooding. If there is a water event there, if you drill through the middle of the earth to the other side, where it comes out, does it balance out? Is there a high pressure drought in, let's say, California? Ah, some people probably haven't thought of this before. Equally, in the winter, if it's freezing here, we know in the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, I, I, mean, I went to school, I did geography, I realise that. I'm just saying localised events. I wonder if there's a correlation, of, as it spins around the globe, all these hot spots are opposing each other. Look, I don't know, but I mean, something peculiar is going on with the weather, no question. I even got, wait for this, <laughs> you laugh at the wasps last week. I got even as close to the nap outside. I noticed in one of our small bird baths, wait for this, it was so hot, so dry, the wasps were coming to the bird bath to drink. Now, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Maybe I've not been looking and I just haven't. Bothered looking to be honest. Well, I wouldn't bother looking for wasps, would I? Especially getting really close with the close up lens. Another bit of interest for you. What are your thoughts on the drought? Is there an opposing correlation of water events and heat events, drought events, opposing on opposite sides of the planet? Think about it. Answers in the comments. Let's move on. Oh, I'm up at Mike's Woodland. We're having a, a chop up, a hack up. Woods, fire, cook up, all that sort of thing. And in one of the big trees that's blown over there, it gets quite a few, the whole area does, in fact, the whole of England does. They get um, a disease in the trees and the ash dieback is what it's called. Over they go. I noticed two things. They're quite, or to me, they seem when they go over, they don't have a big spread root system. Maybe they're not deep, I don't know. But what I did find was in amongst the roots, this is one of these clay root balls, a really weird piece of flint. Now, I have seen bits of flint up there before, but I haven't seen lovely colours in this, a sort of bluey, greeny tinge, so I washed it all up. And, you know, just look at it, and I want to know what the materials are inside the flint that makes it go that sort of blue colour, and what is the very rough centre? Why is it rough in the centre? Is that some 
thermal explosion has happened, you know, in geological times, I don't know. It's obviously been under the tree a hundred years, it's probably millions of years old, I don't know. But I just found it interesting. I've always been, as you know, when I go beach fishing, I like my beach coming, I like going along looking for stuff. Well, I might as well, because I don't get many bites, do I? None of us do it, I think, half the time. So I like a bit of beach coming, I go up and down. With the reels on, ratchet as it were, you know, so it can pull off line, otherwise I lose a rod. When I do get a fish eventually, I quite enjoy a bit of beach coming. I find it sort of therapeutic. It's nice being by the sea anyway, and it's always nice going along the tide line. The downside is you see all the rubbish and plastic and junk and everything and flip-flops that's washed up on the tide line. You know, what can you do? That's the way the world is at the moment. So there you go. Geological information as well for you. Next, Smith, where's the job list? Mouldy pellets? Smith, what, what do you mean mouldy pellets? I go into the tackle room, I'm going, I can't remember what it was, I haven't done barbell fishing yet this year. Uh, because of the drought, I didn't bother going. I go into my little bait shelf, where I keep whatever, boilies, you know, you know, dried sweet corn, rubbish and stuff like that. But I seal my pellets in a seal, like you put a sandwich tin with a little rubber ribbon. Sealed it, I thought, well that's strange, what is this weird white stuff in there? And I took this tub out, I don't know, maybe it's been there a year, year and a bit, maybe a bit long, maybe, year, maybe two years, who knows with me. It was like, I tell you, it was like a tub of marshmallows, beautifully formed, very, very unusual, I thought, but what was in there? Halibut pellets and some other small pellets, but the big, what we call donkey chokers. They're a, if you like, a trout pellet, but for halibut, you know, a high protein uh, feed pellet they use it commercially for halibut farms, I guess. In I thought, what is that all about? So, any of you guys know what type of fungus would spread like this? Now, I hadn't used those and put them in there wet, if that makes sense. So I'm figuring the seal's gone on the, on, the, on the edge of the tin. Some form of moisture has got in there and that's created this bacterial, I'm assuming it's bacterial, growth on there. Does anybody recognise that white marshmallowy stuff around it? And what I did was put them in the, wash them all off. I'm not throwing them away. I am throwing them away. I was throwing them in the water. I washed them all off and they sort of looked fine. It was on the surface. I then put them in the greenhouse to dry. Has anybody, other fishermen out there, tell us, I know there's going to be some in the comments page, have you had bait that's gone off mouldy and you think, what in God's name is this that's eating this bait? There could be some undiscovered stuff there, people. Yes. Well, people, I'm starting, as you can see, to load the old four-wheel perambulator ready for another overnight carp trip. I'm going through my bait in the garage. Yeah, yeah, you know what it is, it's bread, a load of stuff, spam, hot dog, what else do I need? Oh yeah, dog biscuits, in case I go float the fish in. I'm going down top of the fishery. Ground bait, the old Bailey's is going in there. So I go on my bait shelf and I thought, what's that in there? And I'm looking thinking, I oh, know, I don't ever remember putting marshmallows in that tub. I've got pellets and stuff in there. I thought, what's all this white stuff in there? It's marshmallows, great big giant marshmallows. No, <laughs> so I've had a look. I've had a look right underneath them. God alone knows what's in here. Yucky, yucky. Look at those, have you ever seen it? I've never seen anything like that. I really have never seen anything like it. I suppose I can touch them. Let me get a rag, just for safety's sake and in the interest of science and research. You know, the, the truth is I don't even know what they are. I think they're donkey chokers. That's the big halibut pellets. But what's happened to them? Because obviously it's all sealed up in there. Some moisture in there, creatures been in there. They are indeed donkey choker pellets, which are the halibut pellets that are used for catfish. Well, that is bizarre, is it not? That's what they are. Oh, I can touch one and risk it. And that's what's, what they've turned into in not a very short time, because I did use some for catfish a couple of three months back. I wonder if I've actually put one in there 
the, or the damp's got in there somehow, but then it's been bone dry. That's the absolute thing of it. I don't understand that. Is it something in these? What's in here? It's a boy's a discovery. Let's have a look. Ah, oh, there's the culprit, I reckon. There's moisture in some pellets there. Well, I suppose I can wash all these off and use them again. Has anybody else ever seen pellets go like this? And they're big pellets. There's my finger. There's my hand. But that's where they're turning into. I've got to wash them off. I'm going to put them in the greenhouse and see if they dry out. Well, I never did. So, I'm out clearing some rubbish under the steel staircase I've had to work on and paint up. And somebody dumped a sort of vertical aquarium, like a, a small inside aquarium, and I thought it was stinking stagnant. It must have been there six months. Who knows what was in it? It was really nasty, green and everything. And I thought, okay, we go to the dump. I had to tip all the water out. That was something in itself. It was an experience in itself for my nasal uh, flaps, that one was. Emptied it all out. I thought, hmm, I wonder, would that be an ideal situation to do a little beginner sequence, flow fishing? So I've cleaned it all up, I put some stuff called, the wife does it in the shower. If you, if you have lime scale smears on a shower door, some stuff called Viacal, I think it's called. Spray it on, leave it five, ten minutes or whatever, rinse it off. It's really pretty good. I thought, I'm going to try this Viacal on, on, on the you know, aquarium. I did, and then I bleached it with a bit of bleach as well. I thought, I wonder if the bleach will break down the silicon, because it looked like it had been repaired. I put a piece of tape on the edge. I filled up to the top with a piece of tape marking so I could see where it was leaking, left it and nowhere I want it in the house, let it settle, leave it two days, went back, happy days, it's still at the level that I marked it at. So, I'm going to pop out now, I'm going to show the beginners who still might not understand the principles of shotting a flow, what we call in the UK, plumbing the depth, which is basically making sure that you get your bait either on the bottom or off the bottom, but more importantly, your float is set, it's not laying flat, so you miss the bite. Let's get out of there and play with some floats and some water. So here you go, the float top is attached by silicon rubber, beautifully handmade float. This is a handmade, not a shop bought float, four BB shot down the line, terminating in a hook. A large hook, because I'm making a film. Get hold of your plum weight, plum it, plum bob, whatever you want to call them. This one is at least 40, 45 years old. You can see if I turn it over, it's got a bit of cork in the bottom. You put your hook through the eye in the top, rotate, turn it and put the hook point just in the cork, just tapping it so it's, it keeps it on there, keeps it on there and that drops down to the lake bed. There's my shot. Just spaced and this is only just to show you how it works so I lift my float up I set it at shallow depth and as you see the lead goes down to the bottom of the aquarium or the lake bed bonk hits this hits the bottom there and when I pan up there's my shot oh dear the floats too deep that's no problem because I'm going to adjust it I'm going to pull the float up further and further as you can see I'm still not reaching the surface. That's the line that you want your float to be above. Adjust again. Whatever you know, increments you want to use, six inches, a foot, two inches. Drop in again. Oh, happy days. Bang. Leads on the bottom, the plumb bait. Therefore, the float is set absolutely perfectly above the surface. Take off your plumb weight. Do not lose. I've had mine for a long time and as you can see I drop it in without the weight on it don't forget the weight normally pulled it under and there's only my shot which is the correct shotting for that handmade super duper class float it's perfect I can even put another small shot on there if I want now if the shot lays on the bottom like that what we call over depth the hook and the shot even one shot even one shot don't forget or two shot are on the bottom like that if I pan the camera up, you will notice, oh dear, the float's flat. That means you set the float too deep. So you have to reverse it, slide it down until such time as you get the right depth. Assuming you want to use something like a piece of bread, I put the hook through, leave the point showing like that. Pinch around the eye of the hook quite hard. 
Then the other edges, just pinch those tight. Don't crush it all over the hook, the point has to be clear. This could be other baits I'll show you later. The flake sinks down to the lake bed. There's my shot spaced up and there is my float correctly set and all ready for a huge fish to pull under. Well hopefully that's something for beginners. You can see how to plumb the float. That's how I do it and I've done it for years. It's quite important if you want to bait on the bottom and to make sure your float is set right to use a plumb weight. If you're fishing way up off the seabed, the seabed? Stupid boy Graham. <laughs> if you're fishing way up off the river or lake bed, obviously it just goes through on the river or it just sits there. But if you want your bait on the bottom where I feel most of the fish are, because if you throw bait in the water, it probably the majority of it is going to sink and eventually if it's not eaten in between, it's going to lie on the river or lake bed. Okay, damage report time now. Carp fishing. I've had a really good, I've probably had my best ever carp fishing season this last year. Probably, I, don't, I think I've got a handle on it, you know, I'm just, I, I, it's just carp fishing, they hook themselves, let's face it, but big carp, I mean bigger ones. I didn't quite, didn't quite crack the 30 pounds, but film is upcoming, you will doubtless see it whenever I put it up next year, whenever I decide to put it up. And I've had loads and loads and loads of doubles, loads of doubles up and doubles, done really well. And catfish, OMG. I mean, I don't even want to say how many catfish I had in one day, I'm saving it a surprise. And it's not the film that I'm going to be putting up shortly, it's probably going to hold it for a, a while. So, I'm stumbling around, packing up. Tired, yes, I'm tired at my age, 71 maybe, by the time you read this, get this one, read it, see on magazines, I've always done magazines. Stumble, oh, trod on the rod bag, you know, the rod holder. I heard a vague little pop, I thought, oh no, no, it's not the rod, is it? Because I've already broke two of Mike's rods, they're not the world's greatest blanks, but I've got them two second hand ones that are way better than the, uh, than the new ones. I look in the uh, bag to go catfishing a couple of nights ago. Ah, I don't recall that reel having one handle. So today I went through the rod bag, tipped it all out, eventually I found the offending object, a broken handle. Yes, you think you could probably send off to the people and they might, you know, send you another one. They certainly sell you another one. But I'm looking at it, like you do look at things and think, well, I've got two. I can fish with one. Of course I can fish with one. I wonder, can I repair that? I'm going to have a go. It's an experiment. I've no idea whether it will work. Somebody sure to say there's a better way of doing it. And there probably is. But this is my old way to bodge it up and make do amend. So you can see there, well, they're probably cast, aren't they? Look, they're, they're cast on some sort of alloy thing. You can tell that by the what I call this sort of grain effect in the end there. Take the handle off. Make life easy, Graham. I'm assuming they come off. I've never taken off in my life. I just keep undoing screws until something goes ping. Then wish I hadn't. No, it does actually come off. Don't want to lose that one. So I've now got the handle. So. I think it's fairly obvious I can't just glue that together because it's just not reinforced enough, is it? But, yes indeedy, would a piece of coat hanger wire glue in there, like that, so it's actually glued in line, and then glue across the top there, cut a piece of coat hanger wire. Look, nobody tell me at the moment, it'll be too late by the time you watch this film because I'll have done it. Now, I think what I'm going to do is, like we do when we're uh, fitting rod rings, I'm going to cut a bit of a slope on that with a file. Just to make a sort of flat edge, edge to it. There might be another way of doing this. I can't see how at the moment. Same the other side. Got to make sure it is sort of opposing, as it were. Because when you cut, it cuts like that, it puts an angle on it anyway, but I want to make sure that uh, I get that flat. I'm wondering if a little dab of super glue might just hold that in position without sticking my fingers to it. Put it around the right way, <laughs> that's funny, people will laugh. Like that, hold it in position, and then put that piece of wire and glue it here, and then tape it with 
good old electrical tape, and it's black. Oh my God, you've got to have any. I was going to use yellow to be awkward, but we'll give it a go with that, see if I've got any super glue. If I haven't, I'm going to be using some leftover Aldite. It could get messy. I don't care if it's gobby, I really don't. I just want it to set and I, I can uh, go fishing again. So a good, big, gobby gob piece on there. Oh, my word, that's, that's something that's going to stick. So that's why I figure it's going to go like that. That's no problem. Now, how do I get that wire on there? Because that's got to stick as well. So I'm figuring. Yeah, I've got it on me. A good gobble on the back of that one. This will be tricky. Good old gobble on the back of that one. Because you don't actually put a lot of pressure on the actual handle because it's revolving. Obviously they're not built for standing on as I've done. I had to get the wife's hands to help as well. But you get the principle, I'm obviously covered in it now. There's the um, support on that side. I've got it in line, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically go and put this in a vise or rest it between some books so it's vertical. It, it won't move, I've got the black insulating tape around it there, and we'll see if it sets up. But it, it's feeling like it's a sort of splint that might do the job. Who knows? I've actually got it balanced down here, gripped in some mole grips, and the other piece is being supported by a book which is very important for anybody who's into carp fishing. I thought, what a book to use to keep that in support while it sets. Now then, we've all heard about global warming. If not, we will do shortly. Definitely, the weather systems are changing. But I tend to digress and think of something different. They say it's all going to get warmer and warmer and warmer. And of course it is, we see that, it is, there's no question the scientists are right. But, for us it's slightly different. We're, we're in the UK here, if you head west across the planet, you come to east coast of Canada, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, that sort of area. It's way colder in the winter than us, even though they're on the same latitude, or there and thereabouts. The reason being, we get what's called the North Atlantic Drift, which is the last fingers of the Gulf Stream. So that comes up as a Gulf Stream up along the you know, east coast of the States, peters out, curves across, goes to the North Atlantic Drift. So we also get the weather systems coming from the southwest, which means Ireland, England, down the west coast of uh, southwest England. It's mild, it's generally very mild. I would call it wet and windy weather, usually. So if it's getting get warmer, it's going to get hotter. We've just had one of the biggest droughts we've had and heat temperatures. But... I kept thinking about it, because they're saying all the ice caps are melting, right? Well, if the ice caps are melting, that's pushing colder and colder water further and further south. Surely, somebody tell me. I think that will make the North Atlantic drift dip, because the cold will push that warm, cool that water off, send it down deeper, and we'll get totally different fishing. Maybe no fishing. It's going to alter the sea totally. Now, as an experiment, being a schoolboy in the 50s, I can show you what I mean on a sort of weird type of scale by doing this. Here is the Atlantic Ocean. Use your imagination, please. Here is a very antique thermometer which should not be going into water, but I'm going to put it in. I will put it in record after a few minutes the ambient temperature of that water there. That is going to read who knows what. It's straight out of the tap. Give it a couple of minutes and I'll come back to you. So there we go, there's the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean. What I do now is put this in. Yes, it's hard to believe that this, the wife's best egg cup, full of ice, frozen in the freezer, is in fact not an egg cup. It's the melting ice pack of Greenland and the Arctic. I'm going to pop it in here. I cannot get it out without smashing the wife's egg cup, so I'm just going to lower it in there. I know, proportionately, it's just not the same, is it? If that was the Atlantic Ocean, that would be the size of America, Africa, and the rest of the continents put together. It's just trying to give you the idea that what's going to happen, all this ice that's being melted and it's gradually drifting down and down and down, must surely drop the ocean temperature 
in the northern part of the northern hemisphere first, first, of which we are in, I feel, the northern sector. So what I'm going to suggest to you is, will the fact that we are losing the North Atlantic drift through the cooling of the Greenland ice shelf, I'm going to call it, and the Arctic stuff, the stuff that's melting up there, that coming down, dropping the temperature, are we in Britain going to be prepared for the same weather as they get? Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. Not necessarily loads of snow, but are we going to get colder temperatures? And of course, global warming, melting the ice sheets as per my egg cup of Greenland in here, drops the temperature, therefore we're going to start getting a more even latitude around the world. Am I wrong? Is the reverse going to be the same in the Antarctic, in the Southern Hemisphere? Is that going to melt? push up and Australia will get different types of weather. Maybe, who knows, more rain, I don't know, colder temperatures. Let's see what this says now. Well there you go, as you can see Greenland has actually dropped that temperature, what, just barely shading under 60 Fahrenheit that is. So it's two degrees drop. Yes I know it's another crazy experiment in the totally awesome film studio but you guys wanted theory time? There's your theory. Thanks for watching the TA Fishing Show. We'll be back next week. I might put some more in uh, this section like this. If you like it, if you want more theory time, more tackle repairs or whatever, let me know. Just put it in the comments page. You guys need to let me know. I mean, I'm still going to do stuff anyway, but I can try and condense it. And to be honest, there might be some stuff in there to pass a bit of time in this wacky world we're in. See you next time. Hit that subscribe button, TA Fishing, TA Outdoors, go over to Mike's channel, see what he's up to. We'll see you, hopefully, next week.